Midnight Streaming with Jess and Julia. I'm Jess. And I'm Julia. Continuing on with our discussion of Babylon Berlin, our episode today is about sex, love, and romance. We'll discuss the role and meaning of sex in the series overall and then analyze a few of the sexual and romantic relationships of our main characters. This is a particularly interesting topic because there's a very clear difference in the way that sex is portrayed in American television versus in Germany. In Babylon Berlin specifically, sex isn't just there to earn its label as a gritty detective drama. It serves an important purpose to the plot and is also portrayed as just another aspect of the characters' lives, the way it is in real life. Yeah, I think because of cultural differences, a lot of American series will take advantage of the freedom of streaming services and really, really lean into sex as a plot device and just to get some eyeballs on the show. And I don't think either of us are Puritans, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. But this very nonchalant kind of take on sex where it's used to express like very subtle aspects of the characters' emotions and experiences is really interesting. One of the major things we noticed about Babylon Berlin right off the bat is that Charlotte's sex work is never brought up as a moral debate. It's accepted as a normal part of her life and of society by most of the people around her, including Garion, who, you know, we know is famously uptight. He is a vice detective, though, so he can't really be that oblivious. <laughs> My favorite line of his is actually in the club where he's explaining what his job is and he just yells, sex and crime! <laughs> <laughs> Sex work was really big in Berlin at this time. I came across an article from Cabinet Magazine that I'll link in our YouTube description, and it lists every different type of niche sex worker in the city. There are a lot, and the city's tourism board produced Helga's favorite quote, which was, everyone wants in Berlin, which is supposed to be a funny reference to the availability of sex workers in the city with the knowledge and the tacit support of the Weimar government, and it was sort of an early form of sex tourism. So sex is pretty much a fact of life in Berlin at this time in a way that it wasn't in later decades of the 20th century. It was pretty progressive, and I think more so than, like, for example, the 1950s. Conservative backlash against this perceived decadent, immoral society was one of the contributing factors to the strength of the far right and eventually the rise of the Nazis, although they were a little bit hypocritical because they had a lot of gay men in their ranks. Honestly, I think that sex was probably the least of the problems facing Germany at this time. It's kind of like when people get all up in arms about like a Cardi B song today, like we have other problems. <laughs> but you know, our Cologne King, Gary, and he's not from Berlin. Exactly. So I want to start off by exploring how at various points in the show, sex functions as comic relief and it sort of express the kind of wild sensual nature of 1920s Berlin. Muti, the exasperated prostitute telling Garion to remove his watch, is iconic. (laughs) There's also that really funny scene in season one, uh, episode six, where Cattleblock comes into Garion's room to irritate him in the morning. And you see Garion's shocked face when he realizes Mrs. Benka's in his bed. That had me dying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that and the scene where Moritz sees a couple having sex, you know, when he's wandering around an abandoned factory. And then he dumps a full jar of bugs directly onto them. That's happened to the best of us, so I don't I don't yeah, blame them. Common occurrence. But there are also darker, more atmospheric sex scenes. It mostly centers around Charlotte's sex work. Uh, that is really what comes to mind here. It's pretty stylized and moody. You know, they do a good job of showing the culture around sex and sex work at this time, uh, specifically how it affects Charlotte as a person. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you get a sense of what Berlin was actually like with the darker aspects of of decadence and excess. The beginning of the series starts with that blackmail porn plot. And when we see Gary and Raid in a legal porn studio, there are children there. So it was progressive in some ways, but the Weimar government's policy of just like sort of turning a blind eye to the sex industry had like obviously very negative consequences for sex workers, um, it, especially for the people at the bottom of society. They did eventually, by the late 1920s, implement some regulations for sex workers, um, kind of like we see when Bruno visits Mocha Efti, but overall people really had to fend for themselves. So now that we've explored how sex functions in their society as a whole, we want to kind of focus on some specific relationships in the show. So the first major relationship that presents itself kind of early on in the series is Garion and Helga. Name a more repressed duo. <laughs> But I think their sexual and romantic relationship has always been deeply messed up from the beginning. Even if both of them were mentally stable and communicative, which they are not, the foundation of their relationship itself would have poisoned it eventually. It's based on mutual shame and desperation. I think for the most part, Helga represents Garion's issues with his own moral compass, really. I think that's why one of the first times we hear him discuss their relationship, it's in a confession booth at church. You know, to him, she's a constant reminder of his past and all the emotions and guilt he's repressed from that period of his life. 
But I also think it's significant that their relationship in whatever form began when Garion was still a teenager. So even now when he's an adult, he romanticizes her and looks at her in the same way that a teenager would. And that's why the degree of internalized shame and guilt is so intense because she exists in this world that's still under the Garion's father's control. And it's also under the pressure of upper class society in Cologne. Yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said about how juvenile their whole relationship feels. And I mean, understandably so, since he was so young when he was first introduced to her. Right. You know, their relationship doesn't feel very deep or mature. It kind of lives on the surface since primarily physical. You know, most of his attraction to her appears to be sexual in kind of a young, romanticized way. You know, he most likely idealized her as a teenager and then confused that feeling of lust for love. Yeah, and I think that kind of like adolescent lust is very evident when they do have sex. There's a scene in season two, episode seven, when they're in the hotel. And it's interesting because of all of the things that it reveals about their relationship. They're both both almost fully clothed in that scene. And Helga covers her mouth so she doesn't make any noise. So that's obviously, I think, a habit left over from their days sneaking around in uh, Garion's father's house. But clearly their relationship hasn't really matured from that phase, even though they're now alone together in a much more open-minded city. Yeah, Helga even says in that scene, our hotel affair is beginning to feel as secret as it was at home. Yeah, I think that's right after she asks him why they don't have an apartment yet. And I think it's the same theme that continues into the next season of Helga trying to mold Garion into this perfect domestic partner. But their relationship clearly lacks the maturity required to have a kind of relationship like that. And I think Berlin Garion is doing the exploration that his younger self didn't do because he was so enthralled by his secret relationship with this very unattainable woman. Helga in that scene also immediately goes into the other room when Charlotte knocks on the door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Garion stops Charlotte from coming inside once he answers the door. You know, even though we can see Helga in the background and she's fully dressed, so there's really no reason that Charlotte can't know that she's there, especially because Charlotte has met Helga before. She saw her at the police station at the beginning of season two. So the two of them are really being secretive for no reason. You know, if anything, it could be related to Garion's confusion at his feelings for Charlotte and, you know, perhaps not wanting her to know the full nature of his relationship with Helga. So he keeps that part of his life a secret. But to some extent, Charlotte knows what's going on between the two of them. I think he was trying to prevent a cat fight. Oh, it yeah. It could have gotten ugly. <laughs> Yeah, the two of them are both very aggressive characters, for sure. There's also that weird scene in um, Season 3, Episode 2, where Helga's very desperate to hang on to Garion's attention, and she seduces him. And this is shown in a very symbolic way that she, like, kind of stops him from leaving for work. I saw this as, like, a manifestation of the actual conflict in their overall relationship um, between his new Berlin life and his old, duty-bound, very shame-filled life in Cologne. She also already suspects that she's pregnant in this scene, so that's something that he doesn't know. And her holding on to him is, I think, also stems from that. Um, but in this scene, he's really aggressive towards her, and he basically avoids any degree of inf- intimacy and almost tries to hurt her. He won't even look at her for most of that scene. Yeah, he turns her around and faces her against the wall right after she tries to kiss him. <laughs> You know, she's almost desperate to prove to herself that everything is the way it used to be and nothing is wrong, you know, even though their relationship and Gary and himself have both clearly changed since moving to Berlin. I guess that's even more confusing for her because she has no idea why he's changed so much. And this is at, right after Dr. Schmidt has revealed himself to be Anno, which I'm still not sure about at all. Yeah, they don't really make that entirely clear, so I'm hoping they clarify it a bit in the next season. Put me in the he's not really Anno camp, but it's yeah. just me. Um, and Garion's clearly very angry at Helga for what he sees as her betrayal of Anno from 10 years ago. Yeah, but I found that interesting because, I mean, if Helga betrayed Anno, then Garion's kind of equally at fault. But, I mean, instead of letting himself feel that shame, he really just kind of takes it out on her. You know, it, it's as if she's a physical manifestation of the guilt that he feels surrounding the situation with his brother. And now he has no choice but to physically push her away so he doesn't have to face it anymore. You know, when Garion and Helga eventually end things, there's almost a duality to his response. You know, there's a sense of relief, even though he's very clearly upset that their relationship is over. 
Whether that's because he's genuinely sad or because the last link to his former life in Cologne has finally been cut, I can't really tell. But again, you know, that manifests in anger rather than him actually addressing his emotions. Now, I think that's what causes him to physically lash out at Alfred Neeson. Oh, that punch was just fan service to see Neeson fall on his ass in front of like all the fancy people. Because he's not he's not the worst character, but he's definitely the most punchable. Yeah, sorry to all the Neeson stands out there, but he's he's really annoying. He really is. <laughs> Anyways, after that whole outburst, it only really takes him like half an episode to kind of get over how he feels about Helga, which is what makes me think that he understands the relationship wasn't really ever in a good place and has in a way already kind of made peace with it. I disagree with your idea that they're equally responsible. I think he bears some responsibility, but I get the sense from the nature of their whole relationship and from all of the flashback scenes that she initiated the sexual aspect of their relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think she had a greater degree of power over their relationship than Garion did even after 10 years because he's so infatuated with her. Yeah. And that's kind of evident in the flashback scene in season two, episode three. Because even though it's like a very fantastical interpretation of events, it still seems as though Garion loved Helga like during or before her marriage to Anno. And she was the one to finally decide to take the next step since, because we know Garion is a respectful consent king. Of course. <laughs> but I do think she's implied to be at least a few years older than him. And she was obviously in a more adult, mature place in, the, in her life by the time Garion came back from the war. Yeah, they don't make the timeline super clear, but if anything, her character is very clearly written to be more mature than him. You know, that's especially clear, I think, in her clothing. You know, she's not dressed according to 1920s fashion. She's made to look older, a bit more old-fashioned, and it kind of indicates that her youth ended before the 1920s began. You know, she's a mom. <laughs> her literal youth, like she's older than Garion, or her figurative youth, I think either one kind yeah. of works. Even during their secret relationship in Cologne, though, Helga's life moved on in a way that Garion's couldn't because she still had her son. She was still had a, a clear social status as a widow. And she had a stable financial support system from Garion's father, Engelbert. And then Garion couldn't really date or live life at all. Um, and in general, their sex scenes are like a symbolic arc through the show, starting with scenes that are very warmly lit with like nice music um, and ending with one that's very jarring and aggressive and it's kind of uncomfortable to watch. And I think that's also emphasized by the very like mundane lighting and setting he's just leaving for work one morning. Yeah, I think by that point, the excitement of their relationship has mostly worn off. You know, I think most of Garion's infatuation with her came from the fact that, well, one, she was older, attractive, and unattainable because she was with his brother. And two, there was the thrill of having to sneak around and hide their relationship. And both of those things have really worn off by now. You know, they're not kids anymore. They're adults. They're in a new city. And Berlin is a lot more accepting than, you know, his father would be when they were in his house in Cologne. But having an adult relationship requires a lot more than just physical attraction. And I think both Garion and Helga slowly start to realize that. And that is where the cracks in the relationship form. You could call it like a trauma bond. And then once Garion starts to get better through therapy or through his new life, then what is left in their relationship. Exactly. It's hard to grow with a person too, especially when you meet them at such a young stage in your life. You know, you're not the same person in your adulthood as you were when you were 16, 17 years old. So I think they both just kind of deviated on different paths and they're trying so hard to come back to each other, but it's kind of fizzled out at this point. Yeah. Helga kept Gary and frozen in time, frozen in that, like that very traumatic moment in his life. And he was never able to grow past it. And I think that's mm -hmm. why his PTSD starts to uh, calm down by the time he's in Berlin is because he's out of this place that just like symbolizes all of the traumatic events in his life. He's moved on, he's grown, and she's still holding him in right. that past and reminding him of it. So the next relationship that we're going to talk about is our two main characters, Garion and Charlotte. This is basically the polar opposite relationship to Garion and Helga because Charlotte's approach to sex is so open and shameless. And she's essentially the antidote to Helga whose sexual relationship with Garion was like really defined by Catholic guilt and mm -hmm. deep personal shame, which is not very sexy. <laughs> With Charlotte, the complicated thing between them is more their romantic relationship because of Garion's whole situation with Helga and the fact that he's her boss, not really the sexual aspect of it. Yeah, their relationship essentially started with romance, and I think we'll eventually see that blossom into a more sexual attraction. Yeah, they're clearly very disgusted by each other oh, at the absolutely. beginning. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no tension at all. <laughs> 
But it has a foundation in a firm friendship and a shared passion for their work, you know, as opposed to Garion and Helga's relationship in which the foundation was just adolescent sexual attraction. And I think this leads Garion and Charlotte's relationship to be more well-rounded since it followed a much healthier progression. Yeah, Charlotte is Helga's polar opposite in so many ways specifically. Like, this is interesting because it makes us question what Garion was even attracted to in Helga. Because the writers make it very clear what qualities he likes in Charlotte, which is like her dedication, her courage, her loyalty, her Mm -hmm. intelligence, mystery, humor, like the fact that she's so unapologetic. And Helga doesn't really embody any of those qualities. I guess you could say that she's courageous, but uh, she lacks a lot of the things that Garion loves about Charlotte. And they're also pretty different physically, and they have different approaches to like fashion, beauty, different mannerisms. So I think the development of Garion and Charlotte's relationship is very purposefully set against the backdrop of the failure of his relationship with Helga, because all of its flaws are exposed and magnified. There are a lot of intimate moments also between Garion and Charlotte that only take on a romantic tone within the context of like their overall relationship. They're put into a lot of physically intimate situations that aren't at all sexual, um, and that instead kind of reveals their chemistry and tension. This is like when she's giving him his medication on the bathroom floor, or dancing, or riding in those tiny elevators, yeah. or like Gary and reviving Charlotte at the lake. Does CPR count as a kiss? In this situation, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> and there's also him like comforting her after Stefan's death, and the end of season three when Gary and finds Charlotte in Ulrich's like creepy insulin den. But I think I like that it's a slow progression and the foundation of physical intimacy is not overdone in a very cheesy TV, like, will they, won't they kind of way. Yes. They both tacitly acknowledge the fact that they're attracted to each other, but they both have a lot more pressing issues to deal with. I think what's interesting is the fact that they go behind the wall at the party when they kiss for the first time. And I mean, although it's a moment that's hidden from everyone else, It doesn't feel sneaky, you know, like the moments that he shared with Helga. You know, instead of it being something they feel like they have to hide, it's more of just a private moment. You know, it's an escape from their daily lives. They very clearly feel safe with each other and they know that they can rely on each other. And although it's mostly unspoken, I think most of their friends and co-workers pretty openly acknowledge what's going on between the two of them. And Gary and Charlotte don't really seem to have an issue with it. They kind of play into it and they don't really outwardly deny it. Even when Ulrich kind of blatantly calls Gary and out on it. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't say no. He doesn't disagree. My favorite moment is when Graf looks at Charlotte when Gary and walks in like the night after they kissed and he's oh, just yeah. like, I, I know what happened. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte absolutely told Graf everything that happened at that party. But uh, there's not the same sense of shame, clearly, and secrecy that he felt when he was with Helga. Both in a romantic and a professional way, they're kind of the embodiment of opposites attract. And I always say this to my friends, but I think that quote is very misinterpreted. Gary and Charlotte are total opposites in terms of like culture and social class and upbringing and personal strengths. But those things help them fill each other's gaps in and they inspire growth. They have a lot in common, though, in terms of their values and their interests. And those are the things that like really draw them together. Um, Like the dance scene in season one, episode five, is a great example of this. The vitality that Charlotte just like exudes is clearly really intriguing for Garion. And we see him really let loose and enjoy himself in that scene in a very physical, very flirtatious way. It's almost like they bring out the best in each other. And I think that's, that's very clear through that scene where he starts to kind of let loose a little more. And at first it's in like sort of a superficial way. And then I think slowly we see that in a much deeper way that they bring the best out in each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Charlotte initiates their kiss at Graf's party, but by the end of that season, Garion holds her hand while she's in the hospital and he's not really afraid to address his like true desires anymore. So you mentioned holding hands, which is interesting because I think that it's an action that's very indicative of romantic interest as opposed to, you know, just sexual interest. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the writers utilize that a lot to show the difference between how Garion feels about Helga versus how he feels about Charlotte. So for example, when Garion and Helga are in bed together and she holds his hand, he immediately drops it as soon as Moritz comes into the room, which again, indicates his sense of shame surrounding their relationship. However, in the scene where Charlotte holds his hand when he's in the hospital, he doesn't let go of it, even when Helga comes into the room and starts talking to him. Oh yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, Charlotte is actually the one that pulls away first, and the camera even focuses 
on their hands several times during this scene. And I think that is really a way um, for the audience to pay very close attention to each of their actions and reactions to each other. I think that's a good point. I think ironically though, even though there's a literal power imbalance between Gary and Charlotte, like he's her boss, their relationship feels much more equal than his relationship with Helga. Uh, he and Charlotte begin their personal relationship with Gary and on the floor peeing his pants. So I feel like idealization is already out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. They see and they very freely acknowledge each other's dark secrets and flaws. And uh, this is like a major fault line between Gary and Helga. Um, and Helga and Gary don't really argue, if you've noticed that. They just bottle up their feelings until they explode in some kind of catastrophic way. Like when we have... Helga throwing the bottle at the wall by herself or like Gary and attacking Alfred Neeson. Mm -hmm. On the flip side though, Charlotte is not at all afraid to bicker with Gary and I always think of that as part of like a healthy romantic relationship. Yeah, exactly. And I, I know we keep bringing up Helga in the section that's supposed to be about Gary and Charlotte, but that's mainly because the two relationships create parallel storylines that are really meant to drive home just how toxic Helga is for Gary and I think just how good Charlotte and him are for each other. I think that healthy communication and openness extends to their sexual relationship, which is really only just starting by the end of season three. And hopefully we'll get to see that develop much more in the coming season. Oh yeah, the iconic kiss. There's a lot to unpack in that one scene. I think we could like devote a whole episode to it. If yeah, we to. probably. We've talked about that a lot, actually. Um, but the scene itself was really perfect you know the setting the lighting the lyrics of Graf's song the color grading you know it's so melancholy but exciting at the same time you know it's the moment that we've all been waiting for but I think it's also super revealing that it comes like an hour after Garion has lost Helga who is the woman he's idealized as the love of his life and now she's gone I kind of got the sense that his mood isn't necessarily about Helga herself and more about the feelings of inadequacy that her relationship with Alfred Neeson is bringing up for him. Mm. Alfred being the wealthier and more connected, more popular guy. Um, and I think that's kind of how he felt about his brother in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really good parallel, actually. I'm not sure if Charlotte knows why he's so upset. I have to like suspect that she probably does. Um, and the fact that Garion takes this major step with her that literally the same night that he breaks up with Helga is very symbolic of the fresh start she represents. And also the way she reads his emotions so well. Yeah, I think those few minutes reveal so much about their feelings towards each other. You know, I thought it was a great choice to have them kind of glancing back and forth at each other during Graf's song right before they kiss. Because his song is all about love in the face of hardship. The camera work here is really interesting as well. You know, the shots switch back and forth between each of their perspectives as they look at each other. And... I think what that emphasizes is how reciprocal their attraction is. You know, they're both equally in control. It's also a very recognizable moment, I think, for us as viewers. That's something I imagine a lot of people have experienced, like looking over at someone at a party to see if they're looking back. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot can be said that way. I think also Charlotte being the one to truly initiate the kiss by going behind the wall is very indicative of the series' attitude towards sex overall, which is that it should be about honest human connection, not power or control. My overall take on their romance is that it's very significant, but not in a cheesy throwaway manner, you know? Moonlighting. It, yeah. The development of their relationship in general is the foundation of the show, you know, since this intimate personal thing is juxtaposed with all of these gigantic systems collapsing around them. You know, both are given equal importance though, to me, I think this really highlights the way that love and romance translate through time. You know, it's something that doesn't essentially change at all, no matter our circumstances, especially in a crazy time such as 1920s Berlin. Yeah, and I think that's what I think of as a major theme of the show, which is the human experience that's like kind of obscured by historiography. That's like essentially the retroactive construction of history through the available sources. And we lose a lot in that process. We think of all of the big moments and the big people of the interwar period, but sometimes we forget the very deep, intimate ways that average people were affected by these events too. It's also a reminder that the very basic human experience of, of love and attraction continues even in really terrible circumstances, like you kind of said. That's an aspect of humanity that, that bridges social divides and that like no political movement or war 
can take away. And sex in this series also lays bare the best and worst aspects of humanity. So like violence and aggression and misogyny, but also on the flip side, intimacy, passion, love. Look, I've said it once and I'll say it a million times that I think the amazing thing about this show is that it highlights humanity within a crazy historical period. You know, we don't just see what happens in terms of you know, the historical timeline, but how these characters are impacted and how they interact and how they react. I think this is kind of a departure from like the great man theory of history, which is kind of a way to teach history through the accomplishments of important great men. So like Napoleon and Genghis Khan and Winston Churchill. And I think the most important approach to history, because history is supposed to teach us about human experience through time, um, and I think the, the best way to approach it is by looking at the experiences of everyday people. And especially in the modern period, we have sources from those people. And I think thinking about these events in that way brings you so much closer to them. And I think it makes yeah. us even more committed to prevent this kind of violence from ever happening again. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. We're currently trying to move our podcast onto Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So keep a lookout for that. But we'll continue posting right here on YouTube as well, and we'll hopefully be sticking to a more normal posting schedule going forward into the summer. Yeah, thank you for bearing with us through final season. Yeah. And as always, you can reach out to us with any comments or questions at our email, midnightstreamingpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at midnightstreaming for more updates. Thanks for staying up with us. See you next time. <laughs>